Hello. Today, I'm going to read the second part of The Water Horse by Dick Kingsmith. Here we go. Chapter 4, The Last Sardine. It never entered Caruso's head to bite the finger that was extended to him. The giant creature to whom it belonged was simply, in his mind, a provider of food and thus a good friend to him, as were they all. This one now began to tickle him as he lay floating, flippers spread on the surface. Gently, the tickling fingers moved down from his horse head and along the toad skin of his turtle back to his crocodile tail. The sensation was delicious, and Caruso squirmed in pleasure, eyes shut in ecstasy. When he opened them again, it was to see that two more of the giants had returned, and once more they all began to make strange sounds at one another. Now the smallest giant took over the tickling rather more roughly, which somehow increased Caruso's delight. He wriggled so much that little wavelets spread and slapped against the sides of the bathtub. That's the only complaint I have, said Caruso to himself. The food's yummy, the tickling's great, and the giants are obviously very de decent creatures. But I am beginning to feel cramped in this small, cold, white prison. I wish they had somewhere bigger to put me. That precise moment, the biggest giant, as though he were a mind reader, bent over and picked Caruso out of the bathtub. Most of us can remember a few particular things from our early childhood and all his immensely long life, the wa water horse never forgot the moment when he was launched into the goldfish pond. He did not know what it was, of course, only that it was 10 times the size of the place he had come from and deep and dark and weedy. Excitedly, he paddled all around it and then dived beneath its carpet of water lilies and began to scrabble about in the mud in which they were rooted. This action disturbed a host of tiny pond dwellers, freshwater shrimp and diving beetles and wiggly wormy things, and off went Caruso in hot pursuit. Now, with room to move, he was already showing quite a turn of speed, and he caught and swallowed several of them, but most were too quick for him, and at last he surfaced, breathless, to see that the fourth giant had joined the other three to watch him. The water horse chirruped loudly at them. It was, in fact, the only noise he was capable of making so far, and he did it now simply because he felt happy, but its effect was immediate. For instantly, the last of the sardines landed before his nose with an oily splash. That's the last he gets of my sardines, said Mother. Do you understand that, all of you? The last one ever, said Kirsty. Couldn't he have one for a treat now and again? At Christmas, said Angus, and Easter, and on his birthday, and on Saturdays and Sundays, and no, said Mother. He couldn't. It's hard enough to make ends meet feeding the three of you without wasting good food on a, whatever you said he was. Water horse, they chorused. It's not a waste, mother, said Angus. He needs it if he's going to grow into a really big monster. Grumble pulled at his droopy mustache and glowered at mother from under his bushy eyebrows in quite his old grumpy manner. Would you begrudge the poor beastie a square meal, he growled. Yes, said mother. If you want to spend your pension buying food for it, that's your business. I dare say it would prefer smoked salmon. And she marched off into the house. Kirsty looked at Caruso going after the last sardine with gusto. I could save some of my food and give it to him, she said. You could too, Angus, couldn't you? No said Angus. There's no need for this talk of saving food, much less of buying it, said Grumble. What we have to do is catch it for Caruso. Fish, you mean, said Kirsten. Fish, yes, and anything else we can find for him. In the sea, on the beach, in the rock pools. I doubt he'll be fussy so long as it's something with flesh on it. He looked at Caruso in the act of swallowing the sardine's tail. 
He's a carnivore, all right, he said. What's that, said Agnes. A meat eater, said Kirsty. I'm a carnivore, said Angus. You're an omniv omnivore, said Grumble. What's that, said Angus. Somebody who eats anything and everything, said Grumble. Caruso, having finished the fish, paddled to the edge of the goldfish pond, laid his horse head on the con concrete rim, and chirruped. He's still hungry, said Kirsty. though, in fact, he was asking for a nice tickle. So am I, said Angus. It must be time for tea, and he trudged off. Do you know, Grumble, said Kirsty. Caruso looks bigger to me already, although he isn't even one day old yet. Grumble knelt down and, stretching out a hand, put his thumb on Caruso's nose and opened his fingers as wide as they would go. The little finger touched the tip of the water horse's tail. He's exactly my span, he said. How long is that? Nine inches. How long do you think he'll be when he's full grown? Fifty or sixty feet. Oh, Grumble, you're pulling my leg. He'd have to grow fantastically quickly. He will, said Grumble. You mark my words. And only 24 hours later, Kirsty marked them. They had had a successful morning's expedition down to the beach. Kirsty and Angus hunted through the rock pools with a shrimping net each, and Grumble, wearing a pale pair of tall waders, trawling through the shallows with the big prawning net. The children had found a number of little rockfish, blennies, and gobies, and Grumby had caught a couple of fair-sized dabs. Caruso had had the jabs for lunch, and now at tea time was just polishing off the last of the rockfish. When he had finished, he came to the pool's edge as before. Angus had already gone into the house. Makes me hungry just watching him, he had said. Grumble knelt down and made a span of his hand. Stretch it as he might, the little finger could not reach the tail tip. He's grown an inch, cried Kirsty. A whole inch in a day. And as the days passed, the water horse grew and grew. Feeding him was less of a problem than one might have thought, for as Grumble had forecast, he was not the least bit choosy. In addition to various kinds of fish, he happily tucked into prawns and shrimps and starfish and easily crunched up quite large green shore crabs. He particularly liked mussels fortunately, for the rocks were thick with them, and the children spent a lot of time opening them for him. The fact that all these were saltwater creatures released into the fresh water of the goldfish pond presented no problems. They did not last long enough to be troubled by the change, for Caruso's appetite was growing as fast as his body. And his body, as the weeks passed, had already grown from kitten size to cat size. At one month of age, when Grumble measured him, he needed two spans, thumb to thumb, to reach from nose to tail. When do you think he'll be big enough to go in the lock in Grumble? Kirsty asked. Not yet, said Grumble. There's Pike in there, twice that size. But he'd beat him up. I bet he'd beat him up, shouted Angus. He'd bite chunks out of those old Pike, Caruso would. He'd tear him to bits and he ran around and around the pond, paddling his arms like flippers and roaring and making horrible biting faces. No, no, said Grumble, he needs to be a lot bigger yet. We must keep on cramming him full of food for a good while longer till he can look after himself and protect himself. After all, the great thing is that here in the goldfish pond, Caruso is perfectly safe. But Grumble was wrong. Chapter 5 In the Midst of Foes. There's a line in a very old hymn that says, Thou art in the midst of foes. And though none of them realized it, Caruso was. The first foe came on four feet. Early one morning, when Caruso was three months old, Kirsty awoke just before dawn to hear a noise in the distance. It was a sharp, fluty whistle. Mother heard it too, 
took it for a bird, turned over and went to sleep again. Grumble, wakeful in the early part of the night, as old people often are, had dropped off at last. Angus, of course, was in the deepest of sleeps and heard nothing. The whistle came again. Behind the small white house on the cliff top was moorland. Great stretches of heather and peat bog were where curlew thrilled their sad bubbling cries and the red grouse shouted, go back, go back. But whatever was whistling was coming closer, coming off the moor toward the house. And suddenly an awful thought struck Kirsty. So she jumped out of bed and grabbed a book from her bookcase. It was called Wild Animals of the British Isles and was because she was interested in such things a favorite of hers. Something she had been reading in it quite recently rang alarm bells in her mind, and hastily she found the page she wanted. She skimmed hurriedly through life history, yearly life, daily life, and food until she came to voice. A hiss when playful or scared, it read. A squeal when angry. A sharp, fluty whistle. Even as she read it, the noise came again very near now, the whistle of an otter. Throwing on her bathrobe, Kirsty rushed downstairs, stamped her bare feet into her boots, and dashed out of the house. It was light enough now to see, to see as she ran, a long, low-slung, humpback shape crossing the grass toward the goldfish pond. Otters, Kirsty knew, ate all sorts of fish, and to this one, the water horse would be just another different kind. She opened her mouth and let out the loudest yell she'd ever yelled in her life, and a very surprised and startled otter turned and galloped away as fast as its short legs would carry it. <sighs> Kirsty knelt by the pond, panting from the effort of running and from the mixture of fear and anger that had gripped her, and in a moment the sleeping form of Caruso floated up. His nose poked out and he took a breath and sank again. He had heard nothing of Kirsty's shout, nor, of course, had Angus. But soon Mother and Grumble came hurrying to see what was the matter. What can we do? asked Kirsty when she had told them. The otter might come again. I doubt it will, said Grumble. The noise you made was enough to frighten the life out of it. It certainly frightened me. But just in case, we must take steps to protect Caruso. And that morning, Grumble made a big frame, a wooden frame with wire netting stretched over it, which fitted over the top of the pond like a lid. Throughout the rest of that summer, it remained there, day and night, only lifted off when Caruso was being fed or played with. The second foe came on two feet. It was a month or so later, in the autumn now, and it just so happened that no one was at home. Mother had caught the bus to do the week's shopping, and the others had gone down to the sea, to Beachcomb, and to catch food for Caruso. He would be safe, they thought, under his wire lid. They had nearly reached the top of the cliff path on their way back, Grumble carrying a load of driftwood, and the children a bucket of fish each, when suddenly they heard, from the direction of the goldfish pond, a sudden loud, harsh, croaking noise. Frank! was what it sounded like, and it was repeated hurriedly, frantically, it seemed. Frank! 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 Quick! shouted Grumble, throwing down his load. Put down those buckets and run! What is it? cried the children. A heron! Oh no! thought Kirsty as she ran. Not only had she read about them in her book, but she had seen a heron before now, standing in the shallows of the lochan on its long legs, long neck outstretched, peering forward into the water. She had seen it pause, motionless, and then with lightning speed, stab downward with its long yellow beak and spear of fish. But the scene that met their eyes was more comic than tragic. The heron had indeed tried to stab the water horse, but the point of its beak 
was now stuck in the wire mesh of the protective frame. Rank! cried the bird again, tugging madly to free itself at the sight of the approaching humans. And at last, it succeeded and jumping into the air, flew away with slow flaps of its great curved wings. There's blood in the water, said Angus uh, soberly. And indeed, the tip of the heron's bill had gone far enough through the wire to nick Caruso's back. But it was not much more than a scratch, and he did not seem too worried about it. At any rate, he ate all the fish that they had caught with his usual gusto. A third foe came in the winter, not on four legs or two. It had no substance could not be seen or smelled or heard. But whereas the coming of the first two foes was a surprise, the arrival of the third was actually broadcast. One evening, early in the new year, Grumble sat listening, as was his custom, to the radio, waiting for the weather forecast so that he could, as was his custom, grumble about it. And then news of the third foe came out of the radio. Tonight, said a voice, there will be widespread frost in Scotland. It will be severe in the highland areas, though only slight in the western parts. As usual, the west coast of Scotland was to come off lightly thanks to the warm waters of the golf course flowing to it across the Atlantic. But the threat of even a slight frost was enough to put Grumble on his guard. On checking it last thing that night, he found the surface of the goldfish pond still unfrozen, protected by the wire, perhaps. But he first, the first thing next morning, there was a thin skin of ice on the pond. Before breakfast, he stood with the children and watched as Caruso, obviously enjoying himself, rammed his way through the ice, breaking it up with a crackling sound. He's an icebreaker, shouted Angus, running around the pond, arms outstretched and fingertips together in the shape of a ship's prow. An icebreaker in the, in the Atlantic, only Caruso is full speed ahead, crash, bang, wallop. But before too long, he may not be able to break it, said Grumble to Kirsty. Why not? because they're saying now that this is the start of a really cold spell. And in a few days time, a small pond like this could be frozen very thick. Too thick for Caruso to break, said Kirsty. Could be. Thick enough to slide on, said Angus coming to a halt. That would be fun. It wouldn't be any fun for Caruso, you silly boy, said Kirsty. If he was stuck under the ice, he couldn't breathe. He drowned, said Angus in a solemn voice. He clasped both hands around his throat, stuck out his tongue, crossed his eyes, and made dreadful gurgling noises of suffocation. Oh, don't be so stupid, Kirsty said. Grumble, what can we do? We'll have to move him. To the lock-in? Yes, that will never freeze. But the pike, the otter, the heron. I reckon he's big enough to look after himself now. And indeed, the water horse, now 10 months old, had grown enormously. The pond had long been empty of animal life, except for him, since he had eaten everything in it, and his demands for food meant that for some time now, it had been necessary to make two trips a day to the beach. He was as big as, well, it's difficult to measure, measure such an animal against a different one, but since the comparison was first with a kitten, then a cat, you could say that now, though he looked nothing like one, he was the size and weight of a half-grown tiger. Like a tiger's, his body had grown very long, though of course he did not have legs and feet, but simply those four big diamond-shaped flippers. Big enough to look after himself, said Angus. Blow me down, I should think he is. I bet he could beat up that old otter and that old heron now, Grumble. He'd shiver their timbers, all right. But how are we going to move him? asked Kirsty. That's what's worrying me, said Grumble. I've waited a bit too long. 
I had planned to get him into the wheelbarrow somehow, but I doubt I could do that on my own, and I can't ask anyone else or the secret of the water horse would be out. That would never do. This is the problem. I really need the help of a strong man. What shall we do? asked Piercy. Let's have breakfast, said Angus. I'm starving. As they walked toward the house, they caught sight of Posty, the mailman, riding away down the road on his old red bicycle. And when they came into the kitchen, Mother was standing there with an opened letter in her hand. She looked very happy. Guess what? she said to the children. It's from your father. His ship burst in the Clyde yesterday. He'll be home this very morning. Chapter six, Home is the Sailor. Kirsty was so excited at the thought of father coming home on leave that she could not manage to eat much. Angus was excited too, but that didn't stop him from finishing his own breakfast and Kirsty's leftovers. Because they knew what time the bus arrived at the stop at the bottom of the glen, they were ready and waiting on the road outside the small white house when the distant blue clad figure appeared, duffel bag on shoulder, packages under one arm, waving happily with the other. Home is the sailor, home from sea, said Grumble contentedly to himself as he watched mother and the children running to greet him. At first, it was all excitement in the house as the packages were opened, presents from far away, distant lands. For a mother, there was a length of beautiful silk. For Grumble, a packet of strange foreign seeds to plant in the garden. For Kirsty, a necklace made of shark's teeth. And for Angus, a four-masted ship with a full spread of canvas sailing eternally within its bottle. How you've grown, said father to the children. Why, last leave, I was carrying you about Easily, Angus. I wouldn't be able to now. He likes his food, said Mother. All this reminded Kirsty of the water horse and how he had grown too heavy to carry. Grumble, she cried. We haven't fed Caruso yet. Who's Caruso, said Father. He's our monster, shouted Angus. We found him on the beach, and he hatched in the bathtub, and he lives in the goldfish pond, and we catch fish for him every day, and he gobbles them up, jump, 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 jump. You should see his teeth, father, miles bigger than the one on Kirsty's necklace they are. And Angus made frightening, chewing faces. Whatever's the boy talking about, said father, and the others explained everything to him. You couldn't have come home at a better time, said Grumble. We must get him into the lock-in, the quicker the better, and he's too heavy for me to manage. Getting him out of the goldfish pond won't be easy to begin with, so my idea is not to feed him at all today, and then he'll be so hungry that he might manage to climb out himself if we tempt him with something tasty. Come and see him, father, said Kirsty, and they all went out to the pond where Caruso was calling hungrily. They took off the wire frame and Kirsty said, Caruso, and the water horse came and laid his head on the rim of the pond. Holy mackerel, said father. I've sailed the seven seas and never seen such a creature. Is it some kind of sea serpent? A water horse, said Grumble. I've heard you speak of such things. Was there not one in Loch Moor? I think you told me about one. Grumble nodded. Gentle him, he said. He's an amiable beast. And father went down and scratched and pulled at Caruso's ears. What shall we, when shall we try to move him then, he said. In the morning, I thought, said Grumble. Between us, we can maybe get him into my old wheelbarrow and wheel him down the road to the lock-in. It's a Sunday, so Posty will not be coming and there's no bus and not likely to be anyone else about. Caruso had been swimming rapidly up and down the length of the goldfish pond, as he always did as midday approached, Ra raising his head at intervals to gaze into the direction of the top of the cliff path. It was at this time that he received his first meal of the day. Now, when he saw the giants approaching, he began to call out impatiently. He could no longer be said to chirp for his voice had broken so that he made a kind of rough bellow 
like a cow with a sore throat calling for its calf. It was a hoarse noise, you might say. But when the giants arrived and removed the wire frame, he could see that they had brought no food. Moreover, there was now not four of them, but five. One of the smaller ones called his name, and at the sound he came, as he was now accustomed, and laid his head upon the rim of the pond. The new giant, another very large one with a good deal of hair on its chin, bent down and scratched and pulled pleasantly at his ears, and they all made their usual medley of sounds, some deep, some shrill. Then they came away, and as they disappeared, a steady cold rain began to fall. By evening, the rain had stopped, but by then, Caruso was very hungry. He had had nothing at all to eat for 24 hours now, and his mind was filled with tantalizing visions of food, tender spotted dabs and fat little brown rockfish and crunchy green crabs and juicy pink starfish. As for mussels, he could have eaten a barrel of them. For the first time in his life, he felt the need to go looking for food instead of waiting for it to be brought to him, and for the first time he actually tried to get out of the goldfish pond. After a great deal of clumsy effort, he managed to lift the wire frame with his head and got both front flippers up onto the rain-soaked concrete rim, but it was too steep and already frozen, and he slipped back with a moan of disappointment. That night, the frost was much more severe, but the surface of the pond had no chance to freeze over because Caruso's hunger pains kept him swimming around urgently. Dawn came, and the sun rose and climbed in the sky and shone down without warmth, and the ravenous water, water horse bellowed his hunger to the frozen world. And then, at long last, four of the giants appeared again, and as they came closer, he could smell the food that they were carrying. Father and the others could see that though there had been a hard frost, Caruso had kept the pond ice-free, paddling hungrily about. But everything else was ice-covered, for the previous afternoon's rain had frozen solid upon every surface. Even the branches and twigs of the trees were coated in ice. Caruso came eagerly to the side without waiting to be called. He could smell the fish that Kirsty was carrying on a plate. To everyone's surprise, and to Angus's dismay, Mother had donated a small can of herring as bait to lure the water horse out of the pond. Actually, she was delighted to think that he was going somewhere where he could catch his own food from now on, freeing her from the endless washing of clothes covered in slimy fish scales. Hold one of the herrings in front of his nose, Kirsty said Grumble. Not too near, mind. Don't let him get it yet. Frantically, Caruso tried to haul himself out, but the icy rim was too slippery. Right, said Father. We'll have to help him. The moving of heavy weights in and out of ship's holds was something he well understood, and now he took charge. Angus, he said, take station abaft me. I reckon this fellow weighs closer to 200 pounds than 100, and we don't want anyone getting hurt. Kirsty, keep the fish right in front of his face, but be ready to go full astern as he comes out. And to grumble, he said, next time he comes up on the rim, I'll take a hold of one front flipper and you take the other and wait for my word. Ready? Now, Kirsty. And as Caruso reared up once again, Father and Grumble each grabbed a flipper. Heave, shouted Father, and heave, while Angus danced around yelling, come on, my hearties. And at last, with much grunting and sloshing, the water horse came out of the goldfish pond and lay dripping on the frozen grass. Belay, said Father to Grumble, and to Kirsty, give him the fish. Phew, said Grumble, he is heavy. I doubt we'll get him into the wheelbarrow. If we did, said Father, and it didn't break down under him, I doubt we could push him. Let's first see if he'll sail around his own steam. And so began a slow procession from the pond across the lawn toward the road. 
Caruso's grace and speed on or underwater was equaled only by his clumsiness and sluggishness on land. But driven on by his hunger, he followed Kirsty and her herring slowly, oh so slowly, inching along at tortoise speed. What a rate of knots, said Father, looking at his watch. Half an hour to travel 50 yards. We'll be here all day and night getting him to the lock-in, growled Grumble. But then something happened that changed the whole picture. Kirsty, walking backward still, reached the road at last and stepped off the shoulder onto the tarmac surface. Immediately, her legs shot from under her, and as she fell, the last few herring flew off the plate and landed right in front of the grateful water horse. Are you all right, Kirsty? Everyone shouted. Yes, she said, struggling to her feet, but he's eaten all the fish now. What else can we tempt him with? We shan't need to, said Father, grinning. Why not? Look, said Father, and he found a smooth pebble and skimmed it down the slight slope of the road. On and on it slid, for the rain on the surface of the road had frozen into a thick, slippery surface like a skating rink. We can slide him, said Grumple, Grumble, like a curling stone. And that's exactly what they did. The road was so glassy that Father made Grumble and the children walk on the shoulder, for young bones and old bones are easily broken in a fall, he knew, and he took upon himself the job of pushing Caruso. Now their progress was 10 times as fast, slipping, sliding, slithering, and skidding, the water horse glided down the icy road with no effort on his part and very little on father's, and in another half hour or so, they had reached the Lachen, a quarter of a mile away. Then it was easy. The edge of the Lachen was close to the road and a little below it, and with one last shove, they launched Caruso into his new home. It was easy to see his delight at being back in his element again and at finding so much space to swim in. Away he went, head and neck showing above the surface like a periscope, a V-shaped wake streaming out behind him until he reached the middle of the lochen. There he turned and for a moment looked back at them standing on the shore. Then he slid silently beneath the surface and was lost to their sight. Chapter 7, A Bit Too Tame. You see the problem, don't you, said Father on the following morning. I do, said Grumble. He's a bit too tame. They watched the children standing in the shallows, playing with Caruso. Each had a stick to scratch his back, and as usual, he was squirming with pleasure at the rough tickling. There had been no sign of him when they arrived. The surface of the lock and was calm and empty, but Kirsty had called Crusoe, and almost at once he had surfaced and come swimming toward them. He's not afraid of humans. That's the trouble, said Father. Kind treatment and good food. That's what people mean to him. So now he'll react the same way to anybody, I'm thinking. One of the locals, a tourist, anyone. He turned to the children. Suppose a couple of your school friends were coming to visit you, and Caruso spotted them. He might come for a tickle, mistaking them for you. You've not told any of the children at school, have you? Of course not, said Kirsty, shocked. They wouldn't believe me if I did, said Angus. Anyway, said Grumble, there's not many folk come this way. But it only needs one person to see him, said Father, and that will give the game away. Then we'll have dozens of newspaper reporters writing about him, taking photographs of him, and then the world and his wife will want to come and gawk at him. Next thing, they'll want to catch him and put him in a zoo. That's if some sportsman doesn't shoot him first and mount his head and stick it on the wall for a trophy. <sighs> the lock is so small, said Grumble, especially at the rate he's growing. Now, if only we could put him in a really huge stretch of water. Lock Lamont say he'd not be so easy to spot. Hmm, said Father. 
In my opinion, he said, the first thing to be done is to teach him a new trick. He comes when he's called. Now he must train, we must train him to stay hidden unless he's called. How on earth are we to do that? It won't be easy. It means discipline, disciplining the animal. He's had things too easy. That's the trouble. The children are awful fond of the beastie, said Grumble. They get a lot of pleasure from him. You've a soft spot for him yourself, I'm thinking, said father. He shot a glance at his father-in-law's face, which wore an unaccustomed smile as he watched his grandchildren at play with the water horse. If you don't mind my saying so, he went on, you're a happier man than you used to be. Hmm, growled Grumble. Anyway, said father, if we're to keep this strange pet, and that means keeping him a secret, then he's going to have to learn the hard way that he must show himself only when we want him to, when we summon him. That evening, as they all sat around it, a good fire of driftwood, for it was still very cold outside, father explained things to the children. So you see, he finished, this is what we must do, unless we want to risk losing Caruso. If we call him by name and he comes, that's fine. We can pat him and praise him and tickle him and offer him tidbits and make a thorough fuss of him. But what we must also do many times during the next few weeks, father had a month's leave while his ship was refitting at Greenock, is to go and stand by the lock-in and not call him, not say anything. He'll see us and come anyway at first, but when he does, we don't touch him. Don't give him anything. Only speak sharply, angrily to him, as you would to a dog that has done something naughty. Oh, but father, said Kirsty, Caruso's feelings will be terribly hurt. Maybe they will, but he'll learn. He must learn. We must teach him, and we can't start too soon. First lesson, tomorrow morning. The previous day had been a memorable one for Caruso. His emergence from the goldfish pond, his painful progress toward the road, the strange dizzy sensation of sliding giddily down the hill, and finally the glorious feeling of finding himself free in a watery home hundreds of times bigger than the old one. He had swum out through the still dark waters effortlessly, turned to see the four giants watching him and waving at him, and dived down, down, into the depths. And what was in those depths? Fish, fish, thousands and thousands of them. Caruso didn't know a pike from a perch or a salmon from a trout. All he knew was that the lachen was alive with food, food that was now, he found, easy for him to catch. So swiftly could he move underwater. By nightfall, he had gorged himself and tired himself out in the bargain, and with the simplicity that marked all his actions, he closed his eyes and went to sleep. As always, he rose automatically in the midst of his slumbers to refill his lungs with air, and as automatically sank down again, not six feet now, but sixty. The next morning after he had breakfasted, he was swimming idly along in what was, had he known it, the natural and instinctive manner of his race when not hunting. That is to say, he was completely submerged and thus invisible to an onlooker, except for his two nostrils, which were just above the surface of the water. Then he heard the call that was, had he known it, his name, and he swam rapidly to shore. What a joy it was to be tickled by the two smallest giants. He still thought of them that way, though he was now far bigger than either of them. And how he wriggled with pleasure. That they did not feed him mattered not at all, for he was full, full, and extremely happy. But on the following day, things were very different. He must have been underwater when the giants arrived, for... He did not know they were there until he suddenly caught sight of the four of them standing silently on the shore. No call came from them, but Caruso, delighted to see them, swam straight toward them and splashed his way up into the shallows, where he lay staring up at them lovingly, waiting for a tickle. 
but no tickle was forthcoming, nor any of the usual affectionate sounds. Instead, they made what sounded like angry voices and pointed out to the middle of the locket and shooed him away as if they wanted nothing more to do with him. And then they turned and left without a backward look. Puzzled and hurt, the water horse stared after the departing giants. What had he done wrong? He bowed his head and gave a low moan of distress. And that's where we're going to start. stop today. We'll start again on chapter eight next time.